Uh, so, okay, so uh, Sarah's talk was uh, awesome. I'm a big fan of um, the stuff that she does around uh, CI and Bamboo. Um, my talk is called uh, The Life of a Feature. It was called, Tobias said what it was in German, but my German's not that good. Um, I hope he didn't say anything bad about me because I wouldn't have known. Uh, so this is, a high, this is more high level. This is less technical. Uh, a talk about um, best, practice that, best practices that we follow at Atlassian to try and make sure that the work that we do and when we get technical and implement team processes around ensuring quality, that we're actually set up to do things correctly in the first place. Um, so high quality and fast shipping times are kind of two mantras at Atlassian. Uh, and this is some of the stuff that we do to try and achieve that. So uh, I've been with Atlassian for about five years. Uh, in Atlassian terms, it's pretty old. The company's only about 12 years old to begin with. So um, I started in the Sydney office as a developer on the Confluence team. And uh, now I'm based in San Francisco. Um, and I work as a product manager in the support team. Uh, and you might think it's a bit strange that the support team needs a product manager. Uh, and if you want to talk about that, uh, come and grab me later, because I like to talk about that. Uh, so I love San Francisco. It's a great city to live in. Um, this is also my first time in Germany, uh, so I'm excited to be here too, but it's sad to leave my adopted home behind. It's got lots of beautiful landmarks like the Golden Gate Bridge and Alcatraz, and you can see Sutro Tower in the background there. And there's a few over here. There's kind of lots of Americans, which is not so great, but the other parts are, hey. are pretty good. <laughs> Watch it. <laughs> um, but all those landmarks are fine, but they're not my favorite. My favorite landmark is actually one that's not quite as well known, uh, and that's Lucasfilm Studios. Uh, Star Wars began in San Francisco. It's where George Lucas uh, started Lucasfilm and ILM and Skywalker Sound, and the offices are still based there in the Presidio, a beautiful park. Um, and this is the front of the, of, of the studio there, and it just feels a little bit emotional standing in front of Yoda getting my photo taken. Uh, I'm a pretty big Star Wars fan. Um, do we have, like, are there any Star Trek people here? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, they're all Star Wars jokes, so <laughs> I'll do my best. Uh, so I'm going to put some, um, <laughs> I'm going to put some uh, references in my presentation uh, for, to Star Wars, but nothing from episode one, two, or three. I mean, the good movies. <laughs> so... Uh, really what we're talking about here is how do you build a feature? How do, what, how, does, how do you even put a team together to even go about that process? And when I first started as a developer, I thought this was an easy question. I, I was an expert. I've been working for six months as a developer. I know how to build a feature. You get a spec. You write some code. You, like, push your you commit your changes. You're probably like, oh, I've got to test in IE because sometimes I break IE. Um, and then I'm done. That's how you build a feature. Uh, in, in, in hindsight, I realized that was a fairly uh, simplistic view. There's a lot more that goes on into building a feature. It's much more complicated and much longer. Um, and I know that I'm not the only person who realized the error of their ways. There's someone else who came to the same realization. Uh, this gentleman here wanted to build a feature for his Starfleet. He wanted to build the biggest laser in the galaxy, a laser that was so big it could destroy an entire planet. Um, so he, he had an engineering team, and he said, guys, let's get going. Let's build this. Uh, we're on a tight schedule, because we know we're going to find the rebel base soon, and that laser's got to be ready to go as soon as we know where their base is, so we can blow it up. So they started. They got straight away into the building. Unlimited resources, unlimited manpower. They, they got this. Um, but the engineers had some questions. The, 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 the goal wasn't really, uh, fully fleshed out. So they asked him, for example, um, how are we going to move this giant laser around the galaxy? And he said, I, I, don't know, I don't know, put it on a space station. Just big, big space station, big laser, easy. OK, uh, how are we going to defend it? What if the rebels attack it? And he said, um, no, no problem. We can put smaller lasers and some, and some uh, fighters in the space station. Ah, what a benefit of a space station. Great idea. Go me, Darth Vader. Uh, and OK, OK, cool. We can do that. We can do that. Um, OK, it's going to generate a lot of uh, thermal exhaust. What are we going to do with the exhaust? And he said, oh, God, the engineers keep bothering with questions. Just build like a little exhaust port on the side of the space station, and then the exhaust can get out, and we'll be able to move it around. And if you've watched the first movie, the first Star Wars movie, uh, you know that that was a big mistake. <laughs> I guess you could say the Death Star was a low-quality feature. Uh, 
so how did this go wrong? It's the most powerful um, force in the galaxy and they made such a basic mistake. And I think it's because they didn't understand the feature development life cycle. Darth Vader thought that the development phase is all there is. And I think that's because it's really the simplest part. And simple as in, not that it's easy, but simple as in that people kind of understand it very easily. When you talk about software development to someone who's maybe uh, new to it or a, a lay person, they think of like, yeah, you knew code and, and changes and web browsers and stuff. But really, feature development is a much broader spectrum of work. So in addition to the development phase, which is kind of in the middle there, there's also stuff that happens before and afterwards. There's the discovery phase. We even work out what are we even going to build in the first place and how do we go about it. Then you have development where you actually create what you're after. And then at the end, there's like a delivery phase. We actually work out, okay, we've built the code. Now what happens? How do we get it into our customers' hands? How do we know if it's working? I also can't read my speaker notes. That's right. It's a big area of discussion. There's a lot to cover. If you've done a university degree in software engineering, they try and teach you this whole thing, and it takes four years. And I've got 30 minutes. So we're going to go at light speed, and we're going to blaze through the whole thing, and we're just going to pick one or two little things that we've learned at Atlassian that help to build high-quality features. So let's start with the discovery phase, um, which is a critical moment in, in the feature development lifecycle. If you don't have a good process to understand which ideas and which features you should actually move ahead and develop, there's no way you're going to end up with a high-quality product at the end, regardless of how good your CI and QA and unit testing is. Um, and that's because a high-quality feature doesn't mean no bugs, right? It's easy to have no bugs, but to have a high-quality feature, you've got to have no bugs, but then also you have to actually be solving a problem. No user is going to think your feature is high-quality if it doesn't do something that they actually want it to do. So it has to solve a real need, and then also it needs to do a good job of it. Um, it could have no bugs and just be terrible to use, and that's not a high-quality feature. So where do good features come from then? If it's so important to have a good one, how does that happen? And I'm sure you can appreciate that features in software development usually start as just an idea. Uh, someone has a thought in the shower, someone is making their coffee, and like, or, or having a conversation with someone. Um, actually, Sarah and I just talking just before, and we just came up with like two ideas for HipChart just right now, and I'm gonna write them down when I get back to the office. So these ideas are a critical part of the feature development lifecycle. Um, if you have a great idea, then you can refine it into a great use case or a great user story, and then once you have that, then you can have a great feature, but only when all those preconditions are met. Ideas uh, can often come from your own customers. Obviously, they're using your software all day, every day. They're going to be using it and understanding what their own frustrations are, and they're going to have ideas about how they think you can you solve their problems for them. Uh, at Atlassian, we have 40,000 customers. So it's a great, it's a giant pool of resource for us to listen to. And each customer can have hundreds of ideas. So there's, nothing, there's no shortage of good ideas for us to work on. But we need to work out, not only that it's a good idea, but also is it a better idea than this other idea? How do we work out which ones are the ones that we should actually work on? So we need some help kind of weighing them up against each other. And the way we do this is using public issue tracking. Uh, so has anyone ever, as an Atlassian customer, gone and logged a bug or a feature request on our issue tracker? Tobias, you don't count? Because <laughs> I fix them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, public issue tracking is kind of a, a key tenet to how we go about our feature development discovery. <coughs> um, it's really common in the open source world. Lots of uh, open source organizations rely on issue, public issue tracking as a way of kind of communi communicating with their community about what they're doing and kind of having a democratic process about what happens next. Um, but when Atlassian started doing public issue tracking back in the early 2000s, um, this was actually pretty non-conventional for like a big Java enterprise company to kind of just open it up and say like, yeah, you can see all our bugs, you can kind of see what all our other customers want and we actually think that's a good thing and not something that we should try and hide. So public issue tracking uh, doesn't mean that you just have a suggestion box or a feedback button on your website. It's actually critical if you want to get these benefits, you really need to open up what your development team is doing to the internet so that everyone can see what's happening. Uh, 
So customers can go into our, our Jira server, jira.atlassian.com, and they can report bugs, create uh, feature suggestions or improvements. They can look at uh, issues that developers are working on and comment on it and ask, hey, when is this going to ship? Or I don't think you're going about this in the right way. I think you're on the wrong track. And they have the ability to do this on an equal footing with the employees. So it's kind of a, um, a democratic playing field where kind of everyone has an equal voice, except for the product managers who you know, have the final call on closing issues. <laughs> um, and the other is it's a two-way street too. So in addition, we, we open up customers to speak to us, but then also we allow the communication to happen in the other direction too. We allow developers who are working on issues to talk directly to the customers who are interested in those issues. Uh, and that way they can have conversations about kind of what the feature is going to look like if people are interested in testing it early. And there's not um, what you might normally find in a corporate environment where there's someone who wants to control how we talk to our customers. Like, I, can't, I don't want this developer to say something to this customer because they might say something wrong or they might say something that's um, not the right kind of message that we want to get across. We kind of accept that occasionally maybe someone says something that's maybe not quite right or promised something that actually we can't deliver, but it's worth it because we get this communication happening. And that has lots of benefits, um, not even just related to feature discovery. There's heaps of other benefits as well. Uh, but for this specific um, area, the first thing is that, hey, you're getting customers who care about your product enough to actually talk to you about what, what they want. And that's, that's gold. Um, although sometimes you know, a customer might suggest an idea and actually, you're like, oh, that's not really a very good idea. That's just going to make it more complicated and messy. And it really, you know, we have 40,000 customers. I can't just do what you want because of you do your work in some silly way. So even though not every idea is a great idea from a customer, often you can get underneath it. You can say, okay, why did this customer want this specific thing? Is it because there's some underlying problem that I need to understand? So even if the ideas themselves are not intrinsically useful, there's still kind of some information in there that you can extract. The second awesome thing, which I mentioned before, is that developers and users are talking to each other. And that's great because it makes the developers understand there's actual real human beings using the code that they write. And they can gain some empathy for how difficult it might be if they don't care about the user. Um, I'm, sure, <laughs> I'm sure if you've worked in software engineering long, long enough, you can probably think of someone who was an engineer who maybe could have stood to learn a bit more about empathizing with the user. And that producing a user form with 500 fields on it is, does not mean that the feature is complete. Uh, and finally, as I said earlier, we need a way of weighting the issues up against each other. Uh, most issue trackers have some kind of voting or watching feature. So we can use votes and comments and watchers on our issues to work out how many customers are interested in different features. And that can help us inform which features are the most important and which ones are going to have the biggest impact on all our users. So public issue tracking is great but it does have a downside, and that's it takes a lot of time. It's a real investment in energy and uh, manpower to actually devote people to kind of listening to the customers and responding to them and making them feel like they're being heard. The worst case scenario is that you say, yep, public issue tracking, let's do it, turn it on, and then that's it, and you ignore the customer. Because then they're just going to feel like, that's even worse, I'd rather not have that option because now I feel like you're deliberately ignoring me. In fact, I guess you could say it's a lot like being in a trash compactor full of garbage. You really need to work hard and dig down before you find the useful items that are going to help you achieve what you want. Is that too much of a stretch? No, I, I think that worked. <laughs> so we have ideas that we need. We know we can get them from customers. Uh, and there's another great place for ideas. And that's your own engineering team. Just like your customers who are using your product every day, your engineers, too, are also kind of doing the same thing because they need to run your own products in order to kind of validate their work. So they're spending a lot of time thinking about the features and the products that they're working on. So they're naturally going to have good ideas as well about how it can be improved. Um, the problem is that these ideas that these engineers have are never going to escape out of their own brain and into fruition if you don't give your engineers time to slow down and actually think about how extra features can happen. And that's a big problem because engineers are super expensive. Atlassian, which is something like a $3 billion company, uh, we spend about 34% of our revenue on our R&D division. And most of that money is salary and the costs associated with having full-time engineers. And we're spending lots of, these, lots of money on these people because we think they're worth it and they're really great workers and we want them to give their best. Uh, but if 
we're doing that, but then also not giving them time to actually fully express their creative side, and that's a huge waste of money and lost potential. So the way we solve this is by having uh, structured creative time as part of the creative process, uh, part of the development process, and it's baked in. Uh, so uh, you may have heard of some of this stuff. I'm just going to kind of go over all the different options that are available. There's a few ways that a developer can kind of take an idea and kind of try and work it into a feature. And the first one is 20% time, which is pretty well known. It was really famous uh, in Google. Atlassian has 20% time as well, in which um, any engineer can use up to one-fifth of their available time to kind of work on the stuff that they think is important or the stuff that they find the most interesting. Um, and usually what happens is that they spend that time on ideas that they have, or maybe an idea that someone else spoke to them about, which they also think is worth doing. Uh, so that's really great. One fifth of a developer's time is a lot of time. You can really, have a lot of potential to achieve things there. Um, but it has some downsides. So yeah, you get a lot of time to kind of work on a feature and get it to a conclusion. The downside is that it's really a solo effort. The engineer has got to be, you know, if they want to get something done, they've got to be the developer, but then they've also got to be the designer and the product manager and the QA engineer who tests that 20% work before kind of everyone else will go, okay, cool, we're ready to accept your code into master. So what usually ends up happening um, for some people is that those engineers kind of, they get excited about that idea and they start strong kind of hacking and proving and like prototyping, but then it's all that hard work that's got to come afterwards to actually get that ready to ship. So ideas often stagnate in 20% time and don't make it all the way. Uh, so there is an alternative to solve that problem, and we call that Ship It. So Ship It is our uh, internal 24-hour hackathon for every employee in the company. We run it once every three months, and everyone gets 24 hours to work on anything they want as long as it's related to Atlassian. Uh, and we have a, like a competitive element. So at the end of the 24 hours, everyone has to stand up and say what they did, and then we vote on you know, which, which idea was the best, and they get a trophy and a cool t-shirt. Because at Atlassian, we really love cool t-shirts. <laughs> so the great uh, thing about Ship It, then, is that it uh, really encourages teamwork. The, usually, the winning Ship It teams, it's always like three or four people working on an idea together. Because you've only got 24 hours, so if you have more people, you know, you get more work done in that small amount. Um, so you can kind of, if you're an engineer who has this idea, but you kind of need help getting all those other aspects of your work done, you can pair up with a designer or pair up with someone who's kind of really good at marketing um, to kind of cover your own weaknesses and actually improve the chances of getting that feature over the line. The downside, though, is that's really short. It's 24 hours. If you've ever spent time working on a feature, you know, it's not a lot of time to get stuff done if you take into account, you know, testing and validation and dog, like dog fooding and the release process. So what usually happens is that when you're in Ship It, you cut some corners. And you might, oh, I've got to do a presentation, so I might just hard code, hard code this value, and I've got to change it later. Or, you know, I'm going to cut some corners, I'm just going to do the happy path. I'm not going to worry about testing everything. And what will happen is that after Ship It finishes, that like sudden intensity of Ship It is gone all of a sudden. You're back to a normal day, and that Ship It code kind of never moves any further. It's, it's stuck there in that kind of demo state. So this was the, the state of affairs for a long time. Uh, and actually recently, kind of totally organically, this was on a top-down approach, this is something just teams started doing naturally, um, a way to solve this problem. And that's with something called an innovation sprint. Um, it's called a sprint because uh, it forms part of your um, normal agile team's workflow. So the, the premise of agile is that you want constant velocity. Every time, every sprint, we're gonna try and achieve the same amount of work which is great, that's a good idea or something that's good to aim for. But unfortunately, in reality, it never really works that way. There's always like a deadline or a crunch that you've got to work towards, or at a last thing that's summit. Whenever summit comes up, every team is super busy trying to get everything ready so that we can show it off. So summit is like a huge deadline, or like everyone's really pushing over 100% to get there, even though we, we're agile most of the time otherwise. And after that, we really need to like let everyone recharge. We can't just go, okay guys, back to the next philosophy. We did 50 story points last week, so let's do 50 again. People need to like let it out for a bit. Just kind of have some slack time, which is what would happen anyway. So people were just like scheduling sprints with less than their full capacity. So they were kind of cheating the system. Um, in addition to this, we kind of had uh, reporting that happens once a quarter where all the managers and the product managers are all busy doing other stuff anyway. So the developers are left to their own devices and they're maybe like fixing some small bugs, 
kind of tidying up some documentation, which is still good stuff that needs to happen, but it's just kind of like a waste of potential. There's more that can happen than that. So what we do is, after a big milestone like that, we schedule a sprint, but we don't do any estimation or grooming. We say, okay, we've got two weeks, guys. Um, just work on what you want. Let's do like a little week-long ship it just in our team. And this combines the best elements of ship it with the best elements of 20% time, because you've got like a nice structure to work on something together, um, but you've still got like the opportunity to be creative and work on something over a persistent period of time. And I have another point, I can't remember it. The importance, okay, so the great thing about innovation sprints is that they happen semi-regularly. So people know when they're coming up. So something that people say to me when I say, yeah, we do innovation sprints, you're like, well, how do you know what you're going to work on? And the answer is, if you know that it's coming up, if it happens regularly, developers are already going to be thinking about what they're going to do in innovation sprint. They're going to be looking forward to it, and as soon as it comes, everyone's going to be full of ideas. So the question of what are we going to work on, um, in reality, it's never really a problem. At least not for us, anyway. So the reason why we have all three of these things, though, you might say, okay, we'll just kill 20% time, kill ship it, let's just do innovation sprints all the time. And the answer is, well, like, yeah, we could, but actually we're still getting good stuff from 20% time and ship it as well. Um, different kinds of structure motivate different kinds of people. There's some engineers who really like 20% time, the fact that they can kind of ruminate on a problem over a long period of time, just slowly chip away at it, chip away at it over a long while, and then finally at the end, it's a beautiful masterpiece. Other people are super competitive and they love ship it and they will actually work the full 24 hours without stopping or sleeping. And that's their favorite way to get stuff done. So, you know, all three of them kind of produce good results in different ways for different people, which is why we have all of them. Um, so 20% time and all this creative stuff, it's not just like a marketing gimmick we use to try and attract people to work for us. It's actually a key part of our strategy to ensure that our products are kind of staying on top of innovation and continually trying to do new and different things. And in addition, when your engineers are motivated and feel like they're making a difference to the product, products, uh, everyone feels like a hero. So now we're at the development phase. I'm way over time, I have to hurry up. The development phase, if you're an engineer, you're like, great, finally, I've got some headphones on. I don't have to talk to anyone. I just write some code and listen to some music. This is the part that I love. I'm sorry, as Sarah said, that's becoming less and less true. There's still times when you can focus, but development is not about being the alone guy in your room by yourself with 10 monitors solving the world's problems. Right? Not every team has a hand solo who can do everything. Uh, um, so teamwork, uh, what am I saying? There are still going to be these individual genius, geniuses that achieve amazing things on their own. I'm not saying those people don't exist anymore, but it's not the normal. Right? Software is becoming more widespread. Projects are bigger. There's bigger teams working on those bigger projects. And things are becoming more complex. There's more stacks in a layer. It takes more people to understand the entire system. So you can't bet on the success of having one of these guys who's going to be a hero to solve your future. Uh, software development is becoming more and more of a collaborative problem. The biggest, uh, the hardest part of building software is not about the technology stack or how you do QA or whether or not you do code reviews. It's about how you bring, bring a group of people together to collaborate and synchronize and achieve a singular purpose. Even if you do have one person on your team, who can like bullseye one rats back home in their T16, you can't rely on that for success because that's just the force. And you don't have the force. <laughs> this is something we felt at Atlassian because we've grown so fast. When I started in the company in 2009, we had about 200 people and now uh, over a thousand across the world. That's five times as many people in five years. But we don't have five times as many products. We've got like maybe double the amount of products as we did five years ago. So that's five times as many people working on pretty much the, the same amount of stuff. And I'm sure you can appreciate in software engineering, it's kind of a well accepted rule that as you add more people working on the same projects, things start to slow down and there's bottlenecks and people are kind of trying to access the same things and there's contention on resources. And the biggest one is release time. If you've got a big giant product, it's, got a, it's like a monolith of code and you're trying to release it, the more people you have, the harder it's going to be, the worse it's going to get and the longer your features will take to be shipped. So at Atlassian we solve this by encouraging teams to release independently. Instead of having the Jira team with the Jira release, we break it down. We say, okay, 
instead of the JIRA team, let's kind of break that down. We know that JIRA is made up of like 10 different modules, so let's kind of have like four teams, and this team takes these three, this team takes this three, and these two are really big ones, so that team takes those. And everyone kind of, you break down that code into smaller parts, and then everyone is free to work on that code base independently and in isolation, and they can release whenever they want, and they're not going to step on anyone's toes. At the end of the day, though, we still need to release JIRA. We can't sell kind of JIRA module A, and if you want to buy JIRA module B, it's a separate download, and you can't do anything without both of them. So we rely heavily on integration tests and automated testing to take all those different parts that are being released independently and pull them together at the end into a single product that people download. So I felt bad about making fun of Darth Vader before. He's actually a pretty cool guy. So here's something he did well. When he wanted to capture Han Solo, he knew that this independent work was the way to succeed. He got five of the, world, of the galaxy's most fearsome bounty hunters, and he said, you guys, I want you to catch Han Solo. But you don't have to work as a, t as a team, because that's just going to slow you all down. You're all unique snowflakes, you're geniuses. So go about it in your own way, and I just want the results at the end. And that was very successful. Han Solo uh, was in carbonite in no time. Uh, I'm sorry, I, just, I, can't, I can't read my speaker notes from the way over here. Okay, breaking down into independent teams has some risks though. You're putting people into silos, so that's going to cause some communication problems. A developer might say, yeah, I work on feature A, and feature B is owned by this other team, so I'm not allowed to touch that code unless I consult with them first, or actually I should just get them to do it, because it's not my code base. And that leads to this next step where people say, well, I don't have to work on that other part of the, of the system, so I don't need to know how it works. It's someone else's responsibility. And if, if this continues onwards, this results in people no longer knowing how the entire system works together. And that finally results in this terrible situation where developers say, okay, we need more work in our backlog. What are we going to do? Okay, we'll work on feature A, so let's like brainstorm all the possible things we could do to feature A, and let's put them all in the backlog. And now what's happened is that people aren't thinking about improving the entire product as a whole. People have got siloed thinking about individual parts <coughs> of the system. Um, and that means that over time, your features will become less relevant to the users because relevant users don't think about subsystems of your code. I mean, engineers think that way. So the solution is that everyone in the team still needs to feel like they have the power to touch every part of the product and improve it in ways they see fit. At Atlassian, we solved this by doing something called theme alignment with our teams. Um, and it's kind of a big topic, so I'm just going to touch over it very quickly. If you want to talk about it some more, I'll be hanging around for a while. So basically what we're saying is, OK, we know that JIRA and, and Confluence in this example has like so many modules, um, but actually that's not the right way to organize our teams. Instead, let's think about, OK, what do we want Confluence to be in 12 months? Like, What are the key things that we really want to work on? Right now, for the first one is that we want to make it really easy for new users to get started. The second one is that we really need to solve some of the performance problems that we're having with our biggest customers who have huge instances. And the third one is that we just released a new uh, add-on framework for Atlassian On Demand, and the integrations with Confluence are not going to be that great if the API doesn't enable um, everything that can be done in the product to also be done via the API, which is kind of a, a pain point at the moment for people who develop Confluence add-ons. <laughs> what are you things on this phone? <laughs> okay, so instead of three modules with three teams, now we've got three themes. So that's how you organize your teams. You don't have feature team A, you have the new user getting started team, you have the enterprise scalability team, and you have the integrations team. And what this means is that even though you still have all those artifacts nicely isolated so they can be released independently, it's not just one team's job to work on that. Anyone who thinks that they can improve that part of the system is allowed to work on it, and they can still release independently as long as there's a little bit of extra communication going on. And with this way of thinking, the engineers are still thinking about, okay, how do I improve the entire product? So by arranging your teams to achieve your product's goals, you're ensuring that the features you deliver are going to have a better likelihood of actually solving users' needs. And as a better way of thinking of like, okay, I want engineers to achieve product goals, not just work on the code. So, for example, instead of thinking, okay, I've got to defeat the empire, instead think, I've just got to hold off the empire long enough for my medical transports to escape. And that's going to be more relevant and result in more success. So we're at the delivery phase now, the last piece. 
Boba Fett understands that delivery is all about getting the cargo to the customer as fast as possible. Jabba the Hutt really wanted to hang Han Solo in his lounge room so that he could like gloat at it and be really happy that he captured him. So Boba Fett wasted no time getting Han Solo onto the ship and flying to Tatooine. But the thing I want to talk about with the delivery phase, who fixes the bugs? This is something that everyone who's an engineer wants to know is going to happen once the release happens. Because we know there's going to be bugs in there, how are we going to solve them? And I don't really want to do it myself. So you probably have a dedicated bug fix team whose job it is to try and handle the bulk of the load of the bugs. And you probably wish it looked like this. I think this is Oracle's bug fix team. They have unlimited resources, unlimited developers. They can have the potential to solve every possible bug that ever gets reported because they have so, they have so many people who can work on it. Uh, in actuality, if you have a bug fix team, it probably looks a bit more like this. This is a small team of experienced people and they can't achieve every goal. They've got to be surgical. They've got to pick the bugs that are causing the most pain that can be solved with the least amount of effort. And the truth is that the bug fix team should be focused on long-term stability. Right? We want the bug fix team to be slowly making the product better and better over time. And that's never going to happen if your bug fix team is constantly fighting fires because each new release breaks a whole bunch of new stuff and they've got to run around as critical and users are angry. So they focus on that stuff and then at the end of that, you're still in the same position where you started. So, uh, specifically in the Confluence team, because I used to be on that team, I know that this was a big problem for us. I'm sure if you've used Confluence and you've ever run an upgrade, there's probably been a couple of times where you've run an upgrade and it's totally broken something that you really depended on, and that was our fault for releasing a poor quality feature. So how do we solve that? We use feature warranties. Um, well, maybe it's not solved yet, but we're working towards it. And it's definitely better than it was. Feature warranties means that if a bug is identified in a release within three months of that release being shipped, then it's the responsibility of the team that worked on that feature to then fix that bug. And even after that three months expires, that bug doesn't default back to the bug fix team, it's still permanently on their backlog to fix. And they know that they can't just ignore it and eventually someone else will get to it. The only way that bug is going to get fixed is if they do. And you might think, well, jeez, that sounds a bit mean, like, why are you being so draconian about this? Um, and I'm making it sound like really kind of top-down, you must do this, you must fix this bug. But really it's just about a way of making developers realize that they need to accept the consequences of low quality. Right? We don't want our users to feel that pain, we want our engineers to feel that pain, because it's their fault at the end of the day. So people weren't thinking about what happens in the delivery phase because there were no consequences for them. So this is what feature warranties looks like after a year. So we started this in 2013, and now here we are halfway through 2014. And you can see, actually, at the start of 2013, we were in pretty bad shape. At any point in time, there are at least 100 bugs that we knew about which were caused by new work in the releases that happened during that year. And you can see, we suddenly, we got way better at it. What happened? Now we're down to like 25 or 30, which, okay, it's still not perfect, but wow, that's like a, you know, a third of what it was at. And the reason uh, this happened is that it's one thing to actually say, okay, this is the policy now. We're doing feature warranties, everybody accept it. But that's only half the story. The other half of the story is that it takes time for people to kind of adapt to process changes. And that really can take a little while for people to warm up to the fact that, okay, yeah, this is really happening. It's not going to go away. We actually need to work on this problem. Um, and so it took about three months and then we started seeing results because we kind of had team leads and uh, managers kind of saying this is actually an important thing. So the goal for the Confluence team is actually 20. The, the threshold at which you should aim to have no more than 20 warranty bugs. So once we set a goal and started working at it, we actually started making measurable uh, progress towards that goal. So in summary, the takeaways for you, I would say Innovate together. It's everyone's responsibility. Think about how the product can be better and solve your users' needs. And you can do that by listening to your customers and also by allowing everyone to have the time to kind of work on the things that they think are important. Secondly, release independently. You're always going to have bottlenecks in engineering and it's part of being agile to embrace solving those problems and working at them. And if your release process sucks, then you actually need to work on making it better. And by breaking things down into smaller parts, releases can become um, much less of a burden. Uh, share responsibility. 
in addition to improving the product being everyone's responsibility, fixing bugs and making sure that you're doing high quality work is also everyone's responsibility. And you know, talking about feature warranties, there's a whole bunch of other stuff I wanted to talk about in this talk, but it takes too long, I've only got half an hour. So um, there are other things that we do as well about accepting responsibility for, for the quality of a product for everyone, not just like other oh, testers do that. It's not it's only their job. Uh, and finally, may the force be with you. Thank <laughs> you.